Great. Okay, perfect. All right. Um, I think we'd better start. I acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we work and live. I pay respect to elders past, present, and emerging. Um, hi, everyone. Welcome to Architalk number 22. My name is Parisa Izatpanahi, and I would like to welcome our today's keynote speaker, Professor Mabel O. Wilson from Columbia University. Um, Mabel is joining us, I think, from New York, and I am conscious of uh, time. It's 9 p.m. there, and so we are extremely grateful that um, she could make the time and she was kind enough to accept our invite. Um, Mabel O. Wilson is a Nancy and George Era professor in architecture and also a professor in African American and African. Uh, diaspora studies at Columbia University. She also serves as the director of the Institute of Research in African American Studies and co-directs Global Africa Lab. With her practice studio, um, Studio A, uh, she's a collaborator in uh, the architectural team that recently completed the memorial of enslaved African American laborers at the University of Virginia. She's a founding member of Who Builds Your Architecture, WBYA, a collective that advocates for fair labor practices on building sites worldwide. She has authored Begin with the Past, Buildings, Building the National Museum of African American History and Culture in 2017, and Negro Buildings, African Americans in the World of Fairs and Museums, in 2012, she co-edited with Irene Chain and Charles Davis uh, the recently published volume Race and Modern Architecture from the Enlightenment to Today in 2020. And for MoMA Museum, she's the co-curator of the current exhibition Reconstructions, Blackness and Architecture in America. So that's amazing. Um, before I hand it over to um, Justin to introduce Anna, I'll just give you a brief um, uh, note that today uh, Mabel will uh, take us through um, her talk and then uh, we have two um, uh, other people, professors joining us um, for the conversation afterwards. Um, uh, Anna Arabian. Rabindan Kesson and also uh, Nathaniel Belcher. Um, so, Justin, would you give us a brief introduction for Anna, please? I very happily, yes. Um, uh, Anna's just having some internet issues joining, but she is an assistant professor of African American and Black diasporic art um, in at Princeton University with a joint appointment in the Department of Art and Archaeology. She's also a fellow at Wilson College. Um, she was born in Sri Lanka, um, studied in New Zealand and Australia, and was a registered nurse before she became an art historian. And she's just joining us now, I can see. And she focuses on African American, Caribbean, and British art with an emphasis on histories of race, empire, and transatlantic visual culture in the long 19th century. Um, and she's just had her book published, which is called Black Bodies, White Gold, Art, Cotton and Commerce in the Atlantic World. And there we go. And I'll let anything else that uh, about her, I'll let, leave her to introduce herself. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. I'll hand it over to you, Mabel. Thanks. Great. Um, so, good morning. Uh, I know for some it's a good afternoon, and uh, it's also good evening for me, and I know there, there's someone from Canada also uh, in this group today. Uh, I want to begin by saying I am speaking on the traditional land and unceded territory of the Munsee Lenape, and I pay respect to their diaspora and honor the past, current, and future presence of the Lenape on their homeland. I also want to thank Nat, uh, Parisa, for their invitation uh, to contribute and share my work uh, to the current community. 
Um, and I also just want to thank in advance Justin and Anna um, for their responses and for the conversation today. I'm hearing a little bit of feedback in the background, so I'm just wondering if somebody might mute their mic. Um, it might be, because I can't see you, but I can hear you. Thank you. So I thought I'd share with you um, the project, um, Parisa mentioned the memorial uh, to enslaved laborers. And I think it, it will be a useful project maybe to think about, uh, I mean, it's, a, it's particularly, I would say, uh, you know, a project for its context with, you know, with, with its own historical um, genealogy that I will talk about. But I do think it, it is a project that um, engages difficult histories, histories of, you know, the legacy of colonialism, um, anti-black racism and white supremacy, um, and also the challenge of how does one actually build memorials um, to uh, events and to peoples who've been silenced um, by history and the archive. So I just want to begin with this painting, which I have been fascinated with. I've actually first sort of encountered it in a class actually on, uh, it was a class called Urban Forms um, when I was first teaching at the University of Kentucky many, many moons ago. Um, and there was something about it that stuck with me and I've used it many times to think and talk about. And it's really kind of become a touchstone um, for my current academic, my, my current scholarly project, which is a book called Building Race and Nation that uses American civic architecture to understand how racial difference is actually being imagined. Um, given that, you know, these institutions like the White House, the U.S. Capitol, Washington, D.C., and another, you know, a, a series of American uh, monuments to democracy and freedom were in fact constructed by enslaved labor. So there's that paradox, but profoundly a disavowal um, of the, 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 the um, uh, investment um, in the Enlightenment project. And, and I think that is one thing that both indigenous dispossession in the United States as well as slavery poses um, to this idea that all men are created equal. So this is a 1792 painting. It's by an English painter, Samuel Jennings, um, who was uh, living, I believe, in London at the time. Um, and the title is Liberty Displaying the Arts and Sciences or the Genius of America Encouraging the Emancipation of the Blacks. Um, and it was actually painted for the library company in Philadelphia uh, to celebrate and remember the importance of the library's con collection. The collection was actually founded um, by Benjamin Franklin, a so-called founding fathers and an important figure um, in that sort of revolutionary and post-revolutionary period. Um, and they actually built up a library in Philadelphia. People literally paid into a company, the funds were accrued, and then they would send for books in Europe that were then sent back. And this was important because it was actually a kind of public library, certainly for those who were literate um, and had certainly the class standing to be able to access the books. But that collection of books were actually used for people like Thomas Jefferson when they met in Philadelphia to basically pin the Declaration of Independence. And then in the various Congresses that followed both the Constitution and also the Constitutional Congresses um, some years later after the Revolutionary War in the United States, that same library was utilized. So there's this sort of connection between knowledge and liberty that the, the, the collection clearly represents. And the new building was done um, by William Thornton, who eventually would become one of the architects for um, the, 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 the um, uh, US Capitol. Um, and so, you know, here are these books that were used um, for the various Congresses that declared independence that constituted a new democratic republic dedicated to the Enlightenment. So in the allegory, the enslaved Africans signify moral virtues to white Americans and the English for ending slavery and its odious trade. And so here you can see this neoclassical architecture that houses knowledge in history, order, and reason. And this is Cleo, right, goddess of wisdom. She carries a pole and a Phrygian hat, which is a sign of 
someone who had been enslaved, but but liberated. And she actually has her hand on a book of agriculture, right, of, of, of tilling the land, nourishment and settlement and philosophy. And then you can kind of see around her in an arc, there's a globe, so there's cartography, there's music, there's art, there's her heraldry, um, antiquity, you know, with the fragment of the column, you see mechanics with the drawing, astronomy. Um, and so, you know, this represents this kind of world of enlightenment and knowledge. Literally, the floor is kind of gridded, right, as a kind of ordered, ordered space. But what I always thought was interesting is the way in which this painting is also sort of bisected. So on the right, you see a group of enslaved Africans grateful for liberty, the, at least the concept of freedom, being granted, you know, and they're sort of prostrate, grateful. And in the, in the, in the distance, you know, they uh, are situated in nature and they too dance around a liberty pole. Now what's curious also about this, so you see architecture knowledge, right? Because architecture is the European art of building, right? So it comes out of the realm of the concept, right? Of the enlightenment subject. And here you have the African associated with, with, with nature. You know, there's, there is, you know, folk dance, song, and you see ships in the distance. And it's believed that those ships would take the enslaved Africans once liberated back to Africa. And the clue to that is in the bust, which is the bust of Granville Sharp, who was an English abolitionist who was in part uh, responsible for the founding of Sierra Leone. Um, and in the United States, there would arise the American Colonization Society that would um, uh, essentially espouse the same uh, sort of proposition that if we were going to emancipate enslaved peoples, they would have to be uh, sent elsewhere. And Liberia is essentially the outcome of that. So they were to be removed from the nation, disappeared physically, but nonetheless in this painting representing the allegory of liberation. So here encapsulated is the spatial and temporal framework of the West and how it constructed racial difference as an episteme, essentially as a body of knowledge, an, onto an ontology as a way of being in the world, the modern subject, and a geography, right? Because we see here architecture and also land being organized and, and, and one that can be mapped. So one that art and architecture represented and materialized. As theorist Fred Moten writes, the pathologization of black bodies, blackness as a metaphor, in the discourse of the human history and the natural sciences has served as a defining epistemological register of the modern subject. So how do we unpack the legacies of dehumanization that have been the deadly consequences of the, de of the cre invention of racial difference in order to ask how monuments, their formal tactics of figuration, identification, and historicization reinforce and territorialize the power of racial histories. Traces. So in March of 1867, two years after emancipation and the end of the Civil War, Isabella Gibbons, a school teacher at the newly formed Freedman School in Charlottesville, Virginia, at the foothill of the um, Piedmont Range, pinned a letter for the publication in a Boston-based monthly, The Freedman's Record. In her short letter, Gibbons provided a forceful corrective to white Southerners' projection that their former holdings in human property enslaved people like Gibbons, her husband William, and their children, quote, love us and have forgotten what happened while they were slaves, end quote. Gibbons put this grand story to rest by recounting her memories of enslavement. And this is what she writes in the letter, quote, can we forget the crack of the whip, cowhide, whipping post, auction block, the handcuffs, the spaniels, the iron collar, the Negro trader, tearing the young child from its mother's breast as a whelp from the lioness? Have we forgotten that by these horrible cruelties, hundreds of our race have been killed. No, we have not or ever will." End quote. 
Gibbons most likely knew well that white supremacy had not retreated and that her fellow Southern citizens were whitewashing history by conjuring a lost cause and obstructing, obstructing the project of reconstruction to repair the breach civil war, the Civil War had wrought in the nation's unity. And Reconstruction was essentially the period between um, 1865 and 1877, where there was a federal effort to essentially reconstruct the economy, the social fabric, rebuild, unify um, the United States after the attempt of the Confederate States of America to break away. And a big part of that project was then to take millions of people who had been enslaved and give them the rights of citizenship, the ability to own property, to own land, to work for a wage. And that was a huge project of reconstruction that was never fulfilled because of the new project of um, Jim Crow essentially took its place. So how white Southerners were constituting a new regime of racial violence out of the remnants of slavery's tactics of death and intimidation appeared in the letter printed before Isabella Gibbons, in which a white teacher, Sidney Busby, in Raleigh, North Carolina, recounts how their Freedmen school was first shot at and then burned to the ground. Despite these prohibitions, Gibbons committed to educating those within Charlottesville's Black community as a means of repairing dehumanizing psychic and material conditions wrought by enslavement and anti-Black racism. But there is more to her story. Here we see Gibbons in an undated photograph. Her dress with its, its embellishment declare her status as a member of the nascent Black middle class. Her hand resting on a book signifies her profession as an educator. It is believed that Gibbons learned to read while she was enslaved which made her, once free, an ideal teacher within the emergent Freedmen School network. Now she learned this skill of reading, one punishable by beating or death, after she arrived at the University of Virginia, when she was purchased by a professor of natural philosophy, William Barton Rogers, who eventually left UVA for Boston to found the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT. So that could be actually why her image is in the Boston Public Library. I'm not sure this is actually an image that UVA uses, or it could be that this is part of the Freedmen's um, record collection in that library. So as the family's cook, Gibbons apparently learned to read from Mrs. Rogers. Now, once the Rogers left, Gibbons continued these duties under the ownership of other professorial families who lived in Pavilion 6 until she, her husband William, also enslaved by a UVA professor and their children were emancipated in 1865. Now when it opened in 1826, the University of Virginia's 10 pavilions housed faculty and family. Its lawn rooms, boarded 125 white male students, and the verdant swath of the terrace lawn was crowned by the rotunda, the centerpiece of the ensemble that housed the library. And so you could see in the distance that pantheon uh, form in the background, and then you could kind of see those larger buildings of the different pavilions uh, that, that um, were designed to essentially give a kind of lesson um, about proportion, scale, uh, and the sort of aesthetic uh, potential of architecture to these 125 students. And then the students lived in the rooms in the colonnades in between. Now in his plans for the academical village, Thomas Jefferson, signer of the Declaration of Independence, the second governor of the state of Virginia, the third president of the United States, he was a lawyer, he was a surveyor, and he was also a plantation owner, an owner of 600 enslaved men, women, and children over the course of his life, brought together an exclusive community and an environment that Jefferson designed to be, quote, conducive to health, to study, to manners, 
morals, and order, end quote. So notice that circle in the left corner. So when I was an architecture student at UVA, what was silent in the official narratives about the university's antebellum period from 1817 to 1865 was mention of the academical's village dependency on an equal number of roughly 150 at one time enslaved men, women, and children. And we see here an enslaved woman taking care of a white child of one of the professors at the end of Pavilion 9. Now, along with clearing and terracing the area as the law of the lawn or the felling of the trees and milling them into planks, it was mostly the enslaved workers, many of them young boys, who did the back-breaking labor of digging the clay, filling the mulls, and firing the bricks for an estimated 1.2 million bricks for the rotunda. The fingerprints on the bricks, indentations, these traces, on these bricks are at Monticello, but there's a similar example of a brick and a vitrine at, at UVA, have stories to tell. This history hid in plain sight for 155 years when students demanded that UVA be accountable for its history of slavery. When building a memorial to the enslaved community at UVA, how can you make materials speak and mark the lives, their lives, in order to thoughtfully remember this community of friends, family, and fellow workers and revive their humanity while never forgetting the dehumanizing violence of enslavement. Now this hidden history became even more tangible to the black community of Charlottesville when archaeologists discovered 70 unmarked graves behind the university's official cemetery. Seen here is a ceremony of memorialization that began in the city of Charlottesville and ended in the university cemetery to recognize those lives. When remembering slavery, how does one reckon with the racialized forms of its very ad address? With history, memory, the figure, naming, and the monument, all deeply entangled with how whiteness represents, materializes, and territorializes territorializes its power. Forms of domination, Isabella so painfully recalls in her own recollection of a life enslaved. Bronze. In his notes on the state of Virginia in 1785, this is the only book actually that Jefferson actually publishes, Thomas Jefferson, taking stock of the nation and the state of Virginia, speculated that, quote, deep-rooted prejudices entertained by the whites, 10,000 recollections by the blacks of the injuries they have sustained, will divide us into parties and produce convulsions which will probably never end, but in the extermination of one race or the other race." End quote. Now Jefferson's proposed solution outlined in the notes on the state of Virginia was to eventually emancipate the enslaved population and once liberated, they would be denied citizenship and transported outside of the bounds of the nation to indigenous lands in the West, to the Caribbean or to Africa to be settled, echoed in the Jennings painting and foundation to the, foundational to the formation of the American colonization society. With the eye and the mind of a naturalist, Jefferson implicitly understood that the routine of violence that maintained slavery would never be forgotten by those enslaved, as, as Isabella Gibbons reminds us. Moving forward, in August of 2017, members of white nationalist groups descended on Charlottesville to protest the city's government's proposed removal of the monuments to the Confederate generals Robert E. Lee and Thomas J. Stonewall Jackson. These are in the city of Charlottesville. On the first night of their rampage, a group of 100 mostly white men led a torchlit parade through the university's historic grounds, an ominous reenactment of Ku Klux Klan night marches, while alternating cries of, quote, you will not replace us, Jews will not replace us, and white lives matter 
end quote. The throngs of white nationalists encircled a smaller group of anti-racist protesters at the base of the Thomas Jefferson statue by um, uh, Ezekiel, uh, which sits on the north side of the rotunda. Jefferson, who in his lifetime had been a vociferous champion of freedom for white Euro-Americans, but had, al had also lacked the political and personal will to end chattel slavery, which would have freed thousands of enslaved blacks, included hundreds of his own slaves, that statue became a flashpoint for both the condemnation and exaltation of the white nationalist ideals constitutive to the nation's founding and its prosperity. From its inception as a nation in the 18th century, white Americans have deployed monuments in granite, marble, and bronze to territorialize whiteness through representations of figures, histories, and idealized character. The proliferation of Confederate monuments to a fictive lost cause encapsulates this practice par excellence. And to correct the records, I want to call these, um, I claim that these are mislabeled as Confederate monuments. They are American monuments reflective of shared values erected in the U.S.'s public spaces by American citizens. These symbolic expressions of white supremacy in monuments which were erected as part of the city beautiful movement in the 1910s and 1920s, and that's when the majority of them were built. It was exactly 50 years after the end of the Civil War and the Confederate States of America lost. Um, the erection of these in towns like Charlottesville demarcated where black residents under Jim Crow's po prohibitions could or could not uh, venture. These worked in concert with racial violence of law enforcement and with the racialized ordering of urban space to construct substandard housing, deny access to infrastructure, and segregated public amenities, all meant to diminish the prospects of black life. Uh, and this is a photograph of the Robert E. Lee statue that was um, uh, cordoned off um, the the day after that initial night march, and that was the day in which there were massive, 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 massive protests. So in a counter protest on September 13th of 2017, dozens of protesters, a group that included UVA students, faculty, and Charlottesville residents, engaged in an act of civil disobedience. The demonstration proclaimed solidarity with local residents in response to the violent and deadly white nationalist march that had taken place one month earlier and left one anti-racist counter-protester, Heather Heyer, dead. The group wrapped that same figure of Jefferson in black plastic, draping a Black Lives Matter, fuck white supremacy banner at the statue's marble base. What the protesters demanded was for the university's administration to announce the institution's historical connection with racist individuals and groups by, for example, removing two Confederate memorial plaques affixed to the rotunda's south entrance. They claimed this was a march to reclaim our grounds. So what to make of a commemorative landscape of both the University of Virginia and Charlottesville? Toward that nearly impossible task of reclamation and repair from the archive of slavery, scholar Saidia Hartman writes, quote, I want to tell a story about two girls capable of retrieving what remains dormant, the purchase or claim of their lives on the present, without committing further violence in my own act of narration. It is a story predicated upon impossibility, listening for the unsaid, translating misconstrued words, and refashioning disfigured lives, an intent on achieving an impossible goal redressing the violence that produced numbers, ciphers, and fragments of discourse, which is as close as we can come to a biography of the captive and the enslaved." Unquote. Paraphrasing Hartman, can we retrieve in a memorial for UVA's enslaved community what remains dormant, the purchase or claim of their lives on the present without committing further violence in our own act of spatial and urban narration through design? So in my brief time remaining today, I want to address 
the problematic of designing and building a monument to an enslaved community, engaging with the archive of slavery, in what architectural historian Lewis Nelson characterizes antebellum UVA as, quote, an educational landscape of tyranny, quote. Marx. In 2016, I joined with our architects Mijin Yoon and Eric Howler, who have the Boston-based firm um, Howler and Yoon, and there's Mijin on the left. She's now the dean um, at Cornell University School of Architecture. Um, uh, I joined activist and conflict mediator UVA professor Frank Dukes, who you see on the right. He was actually part of the Blue Ribbon Commission in Charlottesville that recommended removing the Lee and the Jackson statues that prompted the white uh, national, uh, nationalist rampage. Uh, we also joined, were joined with uh, landscape architect Greg Bling. And a year later, the artist Eta Otitigbe, who you see there standing with Frank, uh, joined our team. We actually won a commission to design the memorial to enslaved laborers at the University of Virginia, which opened in the spring of 2020. So we were fortunate to join an already robust community of educators, students, staff, and community members taking stock of the history of slavery at the university. Um, in 2007, students had demanded that the university um, uh, uh, recognize and begin to uh, uh, essentially unearth that history of slavery. There were protests. Um, another group of students came a few years later, demanded that the university actually do a memorial. So really all of this, the, the, the memorial and what became the President's Commission to Study Slavery at the university came from student activism. And so the memorial's design emerged from an extended public dialogue with interesting members of the Charlottesville uh, community, um, in part opening a dialogue with black Charlottesvillians mindful of the history of mistrust and suspicion that many harbored against an institution that many still refer to as the plantation. The geography of slavery still shaped the memory and the reality of black residents who feared being out of place on the pristine lawn, uh, policing of the university, and were still faced with expensive housing costs, uh, low wages, while well, they might have worked um, for the university, um, as, as well as high housing costs as the university continues to expand outwards, and a segregated school system. So what we heard was that the memorial needed to tell the unvarnished truth about the past to have any legitimacy, and that it needed to bring the community together to both learn and reflect on that history. That it needed to express dualities, not only pain and suffering, but also the resilience, dignity, and humanity of those who were enslaved. And lastly, the memorial needed to be a living one, an ongoing memorial to acknowledge that the work of this commemorative landscape remains incomplete. So along with collecting aspirations, hearing about desired meanings and experiences and the stories that needed to be told by the memorial, we also researched black traditions and spaces of gathering. As part of our design process, we looked for cultural forms and rituals that could be translated into our design. We explored, for example, ring shouts, as you see here in this image um, of a ring shout being performed on stage by the Dance Theater of Chicago. And ring shouts are a low country. This is the low country of South Carolina. This is the area of South Carolina where the sea islands are. And that was an area that retained a lot of Africanist cultural practices, uh, uh, languages, um, uh, uh, cultural art making, um, and everyday uh, t uh, sensibilities about making, making forms. So in this ecstatic dance, performers move in a circles, and those rhythms and movement connect to West African practices. And so we started to think about circular forms like the ring shout, a broken shackle, um, that became relevant references for us. It was important to really convey the material presence of black lives at UVA. 
um, as one response to the survey that we actually conducted shared, as a black American, I feel an internal pride of gazing upon every brick, every pillar, and every garden at the university, and knowing that this fraught past has birthed an undeniably beautiful present, so that we must feel beauty, pride, and gratitude. We heard at our outreach meetings that the memorial needed to forge a connection to the community, right? So a sense that the university was actually um, accessible. And we spent, um, uh, we started the project in October of 2016, and we didn't really do any design work till January of 2017, and we had to basically get the design approved by the, essentially the university's board of trustees in June. So we didn't have a lot of time to develop the project, and the university had no site, no budget, um, and essentially no idea of what they, they wanted to do. So we had to help them figure it out. So that's why this outreach was really important, where we spoke with students, we spoke with faculty, alumni, staff, administration, and then we did these outreach, outreach um, efforts um, within Charlottesville at black churches. We met at the Jefferson uh, Community Center um, in, in, in the town. So these meetings were extremely important. So in response and after careful study, we cited the memorial in an area known as the Triangle of Grass, which is a threshold to the campus, otherwise known as the grounds, making it visible and accessible to the wider Charlottesville community. The memorial joins a local commemorative landscape. Its circular lawn was designed to be a gathering space for events such as the yearly Freedom and Liberation Day March on March 3rd that remembers the day that Union troops liberated the 14,000 enslaved persons, like Isabella Gibbons' family, in Albemarle County, and that was in 1865. So we started the memorial in dialogue with Jefferson's rotunda. The rotunda sits at the highest point of the lawn, which was placed at a ridge line of a hill upon which the university grounds were built. The careful terracing of the lawn in section allowed Jefferson to create pavilions that were two stories on the lawn side, but three stories on the garden side, creating a lower level walkout basement which housed spaces for the labor of the enslaved. The spaces behind the pavilions enclosed by the famous serpentine walls, and these walls are literally, they're one brick thick, but it's exactly the arc that gives them their, their um, stability. So what those walls did, and they're taller than they, they, the, war, the current walls are, they hid the workyards. And this is where enslaved workers chopped wood, they hauled water, they washed the clothing of the professors and the students, and they slaughtered animals for smokehouses. So Jefferson understood slavery to be abhorrent and abhorred architecture, the architectural section, to conceal it. He does exactly the same thing um, at Monticello, where the dependencies um, are hidden below ground so that you have these sort of pristine vistas, right, of the, the wilderness, right, um, or what was believed to be wilderness because the land was in fact settled by um, indigenous populations. So the memorial is a series of nested rings fabricated in Virginia Miss granite from a nearby quarry. The center, you see at the top, holds a gathering space, this is grass, which is inscribed next by an inner ring, which holds a timeline and a fountain, a timeline of historical events and a, and a kind of water table fountain. The next layer of the ring creates a concave surface of remembrance of names, and the outer convex surface creates a canvas for expression. And each of these rings speaks to a different layer of history, meaning, and interpretation. The memorial is oriented northward, the direction of freedom. And there, the path to the left lays out a step for each of the year enslaved peoples lived at the University of Virginia. And I should also add that the dimension of the memorial is 80 feet, which is exactly the same dimension of the um, rotunda. So there's a kind of doubling and a sort of remarking and reinscription that we were attempting to, to forge in the design. 
So to develop the layers of history in the memorial, we work closely with a really great group of committed historians whose thoughtful examination of UVA's enslaved community provided rich material. And you see here one of the, the ledgers of December where extra hands were hired at Christmas. And most of the enslaved were in fact rented. The only people who actually owned, I think the university owned it, they believe two to three people over the course of that period between 1817 and 1825. Typically they rented people for a week or a year. The people who ran the hotels and the professors owned people. And so together that's what constituted between 130 and 150 people. So we were asked to name names to tell the story of the enslaved community. And this required that we engage an archive of work ledgers and personal letters. These are exactly the numbers and ciphers that Hartman mentions of enslaved owners, of slave owners. As such, it is an archive of daily life, one laced with silences and haunted by violence. Now historians estimate that 4,000 men, women, and children built, labored, and lived at UVA in that antebellum period from 1817 to 1865, but we know very little details about their lives. So for most, which is 311, 111 persons to be exact, the archives do not record a first name or a last name. As the spreadsheet to the right shows, we found records for 889 persons. Of those 889 references, we know mostly the first names of 577 community members. For a handful of people like Isabella Gibbons, Sally Cottrell, Thrumston Hearn, Henry Martin, we know a first name and a last name. But for the remaining 311 out of the 889 recorded persons, you know, which would have been cited as three hands, for example, we used kinship relationships and occupations to remember their lives. So as you walk into the memorial, you become enveloped by a kind of genealogical cloud of names, of marks, and relationships. The list of names are traditional features of Western memorials. We see these on war memorials, for example, in the United States. The Vietnam Memorial is an example of that, where you see the first name, the last name, and there's always a year that sort of accompanies and maybe a place or, or that specifically. But given our archive, we had to reimagine social relations and rehumanize the experiences of the enslaved, right? Because not having a name, not having a last name, having a first name that could change is exactly the violence that enslavement enacts. So as a result, we use kinship and community. So visitors engage Henry and Isabella Gibbons, Jane, Jack, Robert, and Randalls as families of sisters, grandmothers, uncles, and friends. We engage them as workers who took pride in what they did as woodcutters, janitors, laundresses, and fiddlers. Carved into the granite, we also placed 4,000 memory marks that record the violence of the erasure of the name, but also mark their presence within a community and the possibility of descendants connecting to their family, which happened recently in January with the inscription of the names of members of the Thrumston Hearn family. So the community of names appears across from a bench with a timeline and a water feature that captures the attentions of visitors who learn a very different history of the university. So in contrast to the wall of marks and names, which rises and inclines outward, a shallow near level water table shares with visitors the history of enslavement at the university. The 70 historical entries inscribed into the water table begin with the arrival of enslaved to Virginia in 1619 and ends with the passing of Isabella Gibbons in 1890. The timeline covers the arrival of 10 enslaved laborers to clear the land that would become the university in 1817 and covers a history of transactions, work, and violence. Here are three examples. 1826, faculty seek control of the enslaved. 
calling for the creation of a licensing system that requires African Americans waiting upon students on grounds to carry badges. 1826-27, Nelson cares for horses at a stable, works as a gardener, chops wood, and makes bricks. 1826-29, Thrimston Hearn, quote, a tolerable good stone cutter, does stonework at UVA, including completing the rotunda steps. A steady stream of shallow water washes over the entire arc of the timeline, referencing libation rituals and the currents of rivers that carry people to freedom. Mabel, sorry for interruption. If you can please um, wrap up in three, four minutes, then we'll have some time, maybe around 10 minutes for conversation, please. Thank you. Okay, yeah, I am almost done. So Isabella Gibbons is the only member of the enslaved community from which the archives have yielded a full name, a date of death, a photograph, and a brief mention and record of her experiences. She serves as a witness for her community and her remembrance concludes the historical timeline. Eta Ota Tigbe became interested in layering the information we gleaned from conversations, historic sites, and archives, such as rare photographs like Isabella Gibbons, he also was interested in these rough tombstones like the one from the Daughter of Zion African-American burial ground because of the way in which it shows the mark of the stone carver and the mason. These traces mark the presence of black labor that was typically rendered invisible and or veiled their blackness, but especially the labor of women like Gibbons whose subjectivity um, is often impossible to represent. Um, in archives. So to realize a relief image in granite, the team developed with Eto a unique process and customized software with our fabricator Quarastone in Madison, Wisconsin. The intensity of data was translated from the Gibbons photograph into a virtual model, then into a machine tool path, which was creating a virtual surface that was overlaid onto a digital model of the stone's curved surface. Um, and here you see the exterior surface and the ways in which it marks sort of the vertical marks of stone race masonry, um, kind of like marking the memory and then the bush hammering, right? That is sort of like the marking of the headstone. And it also marks Isabella Gibbons. And so you can kind of see in that image on the right, a left eye emerging on the panel. Carved out of the Virginia Miss granite, rather than a figured in molten bronze, Isabella Gibbon's eyes appear or disappear based on the mood of the sky and the approach of the body. Flickering between appearance and disappearance, it evades legibility and hence no ability. Gibbon serves as a witness for and a watcher of her community, bringing together their lives known and unknown to ours. Reckoning. Three days after the construction fence at the memorial was removed in June of 2020, UVA's medical school, White Coats for Black Lives, organized a protest. The group took the knee for eight minutes and 49 seconds in remembrance of the murder of George Floyd, a gruesome reminder of the violence and injustices that persist in the wake of slavery. The memorial that weekend became a gathering site for Black Lives Matters protests mar marching through Charlottesville. The Memorial for Enslaved Laborers at UVA came into fruition through a collective desire to face the past. Another community made visible through this collective reckoning was a group claiming kinship with the enslaved community. And here we see the reunion of descendants with their ancestors who lived, worked, and died on the grounds of UVA. That connection between descendants and ancestors, those black neighborhoods and community in Charlottesville and the university is a beginning, not only of remem remembrance, but also of accountability, to reckon with the truths, including the horrible cruelties as the given quote remind on the timeline described. It's a transitional site of justice. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Mabel. Um, Nathan, and I just over to you. Thanks, Mabel. Um, I, I, I wanted to start by uh, Thanking you for the, the provocation that you've, you you put on the table, especially in this context. Um, as someone that's been in Australia for about a year, 
and a half. Many of the themes that you're talking about, both in the way you started your conversation, invoking the Lenape, as well as the way in which you um, have really put it into the broader context of reconciliation would be the term here, um, seems to me uh, a pattern that's going to continue throughout um, the world as we deal with what memorialization, what gathering, what community means means long term. So I'm, I'm struck by a couple of things. One is that um, as a student at UVA and the classic idea of going through that landscape, both studying and walking through that landscape, you're actually embedding uh, a sense of permanence and, and, and change in a place that's been valorized around all the sort of formal uh, characteristics of your education, the, the Jefferson statue being on access with a rotunda, and then the decision for the location of your of, of the monument really, in a way, is a very, very different different strategy about creating place. So I, I'm really struck by that that narrative, and I'm I'm curious how how you feel as though um, you deal with the responsibility of responding to the the the, the context of this moment, um, it has been received. March 3rd occurred a couple months ago, and then the event, the spontaneous um, uh, event and gathering and the, the sort of, the sense that this place provides a certain amount of healing in the wake of what happened with George Floyd, I think is a, is a very powerful um, testament to how it might work. So I'm just as, a, as an architect that is both trained in the sort of the formal logic of the, the rotunda and understood that and it was probably introduced to you in a very different way to the way you saw it when you actually had a chance to engage with it directly. I'm, I'm just curious about how you how you feel about it having a life of its own. You know, thank you for that, that question, Matt. Again, thanks for the invitation to share my work. Um, yeah, I mean, I think for us, we, you know, the, the dedication of the memorial was supposed to have been April 2020, and that didn't happen because of COVID, just shut down. Um, and so they just happened to need, they had to take down the construction fence because they had to finish sodding the site, right? And instantly, it was just this magnet, like it was just like, this is connected to contemporary struggle, right? But that's yeah. actually, I think that's why we got the project. We actually, in our presentation, um, for our request for proposal when we were interviewing, we were interviewing against four other, four landscape architecture firms. We were the only kind of architecture team um, to compete for it. We just asked questions and we made that link with Black Lives Matter, actually, that there's a contested memorial landscape and that we need to really think about what does this mean? Um, and the fact that that happened, it really felt like, you know, that we had really designed a space that would be meaningful. And the reason we, we really wanted to make a gathering space was because the students who actually started met, they call themselves Mel, the more into enslaved laborers. So they wanted a space where they could gather, right, for protest, when they wanted to meet, when, so we knew, and they were the first group we met with, that we needed to make that, 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 that ground, right, for, for meeting. And, and it's really become, you know, a space where different groups have really engaged it. And we imagine performances could happen there. The par parabolic curve actually has really great sound reflection. So, yeah. you know, it's, it's kind of an ideal space for gathering in that, that regard. I'd be curious to, especially with Anna, you know, the presence of the black body being a consistent part of, 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 of this memorial without representing it through a, a replication of the body, which is the way Jefferson is represented in the statue as the sort of the triangle of spaces or that are engaged in there. And um, I, this is a subject that I think Anna might be able to respond. I'm just curious what her thoughts are about this project as well. Anna, are you here? I am here. Hi, Anna. <laughs> Good to see you again. Lovely to see you. Let me just um, fan girl again. It's wonderful to be in contact. <laughs> it always has um, been a big inspiration for mine. So, um, yeah, I mean, I my question actually was very much related to the way Nat ended his uh, his thoughts just then, um, because I think you showed us this really powerful, but also very care, and I'm saying a careful way of translating historical interpretation into spatial practice. And I think, um, so of course, you know, drawing on Saidiya's work, um, 
you know, that, that's an, such an important framework. And I, for me, you, I think the, the way you were thinking about um, commemoration reminded me of, um, you probably, I'm sure you know Deb Thomas's work, but just the people that don't know her work. Um, Deb Thomas's work, Political Life in the Wake of the Plantation, and she talks there and kind of towards the end about the, you know, this, this tension between sort of witnessing or observing the past and how, how we move between these positions. Um, and and I, you know, I'm, I was really struck by the fact that there is no representation and yet we are looking at history, looking at the past through these other effective registers. Um, Audio, um, written text and I mean of course that's also something that Tina Camp talks a lot about too and so I'm, I'm I guess I'm just wondering how you think about these how you think about that this act of witnessing and whether whether that um, that process or that practice might compel us to actually do away with the word commemorate given its given its history um, or does it give us another another position? Yeah, no, thank you for that. One, congratulations on your book. <laughs> but um, yeah, no, that, that's a really fantastic uh, question. Um, you know, it's funny because when you're practicing or doing something, you're, you're not thinking about it. You're just sort of responding like we got a deadline and we have to get X, Y, and Z done. Um, I think the great thing was that we we had a really great team who understood immediately that this was not over. Like we didn't think about it as the past. We understood the memorial, you know, connected to everyday struggle for a living wage, for, you know, for an education, for, you know, that, that like, you know, we live in the wake of slavery. Like we all got that, which is why I thought it was a great group of people to work with. But so did our, our collaborators in the university. Like, you know, people had no problem saying white supremacy. Like, it was a really amazing community to connect with and think with about these. Um, but I realized in retrospect, this question of like marking was important because I think we, we realized that we couldn't make the monument, right? Like that form in the West couldn't accommodate that violence, right? Because, you know, blackness is, is not, you know, it, it's not configured in the same way. It's not inscripted in the same way. And clearly that problem of the, the naming the names, what we kept calling was the unknown unknown problem. Like, what do we do? Um, sort of led to, to tactics of marking that were very ephemeral. Um, there was a point at a meeting where uh, there was a descendant, she's a descendant both of Monticello, but now realizes she's a descendant of this community as well. It's like, well, we wanna see who they are. They were, she was concerned that this had become very abstract and she was right. Like we, we, we found a site, but we didn't quite understand what was going to be there. And she's like, I need to see people. We need bronze. We, and of course, there were some artists in the audience who was like, you know, scoping for commission who wanted to put these bronze figures. And we were like, absolutely not. We are not going to put these generic figures of enslaved people to somehow make it real life. So we really liked Eto's work and the ways in which that lenticular image works and he was actually doing that as you know as literally a nigerian american what does it mean to wear a hoodie how is he hyper visible and invisible so his work spoke to us about again a condition today that is not over and so eto you know came on on board and so we started to kind of work on that question right of how to make this this figure appear and disappear and, and i'm so glad it's you know, it's this woman who, you know, kind of is, is, is her community, which is really powerful, which is also very unusual. Speaking back to Thomas Jefferson, so to speak. Yeah, yeah that, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I, it strikes me too that the work is, it's so embedded in black feminist practice. Yeah. Yeah, there was a moment where I shared it, because uh, Saidiya uh, Hartman and Christina Sharp, Tina Camp, Deb Tom, we're in a collective together. And I shared it with Christina and Saidiya, like, this is our timeline and we're fighting, you know, you know, that timeline was actually quite controversial. And we got into, I can probably say this now, we kind of did get into a fight where the president kind of had to come in and, and try to smooth it out between us and the board of visitors. So it was a very contested because it wasn't telling 
it wasn't telling the official history and it wasn't like and you know the great mr so and so did this and the great mr so and so now this was it was a violent history and it was a you know it's a history of the everyday and that's not what they were expecting yeah yeah well, and that in and of itself is a whole story about how do you take a history and that history was that timeline was incredibly violent the first round i just had to shut the document because it was just so dispiriting to read so but we had to go through you know, again and again and again to try to like literally rehumanize and find their humanity in, in that, in that, you know, in the, in the evidence. Well, Great. I mean, it's groundbreaking, I think, in the US, that you're done. Sorry, Matthew. Yeah. That's quite all right. Thank you. I do think it's an incredible contribution to the conversation <clears throat> and extremely timely. And I can't help but think what happened in um, in uh, with the Vietnam Memorial that they eventually did put similar thing happened, a similar conversation, and a generation later they ended up putting up figures which resolved that kind of the need to see something that represented the soldiers in the Vietnam War. So I mean I do think, as you said, it's really a lived conversation. And you've started it on its own journey, and in a way, the next generation will decide to what degree they can hold to heart that narrative. Because in the Vietnam Memorial, there was a similar conversation around representation and abstraction. And in the end, what was it 15, 20 years later, they put up the figure walking through the landscape because they just had to see the body. They had to see the sort of representation. And it's and you you know similar to the monuments being torn down, you never know what time will. But I mean, you by by saying that this is something I've started and launched into the public, it's I think it's appropriate. You can't go off of that. Thank you for this. A couple of thank you messages in the chat box. If anyone else has any question, Hi. yes, Justin. Hi Mabel, thank you. That was a really fascinating talk, but it was also it's also an incredibly sort of complex and layered proposal and monument that you've made in that space. Um, and it's sort of almost to me there's a sort of that conversation you were sort of talking about about how do you do something that leaves a very different history um, as a place to gather, not just as a sort of statement of, of, of a spatial condition, but actually as a continuing history that can't be pushed into the past. Um, because some of the conversations around this topic in Australia are about, oh, can't we all leave that behind us now and move on? Um, and I was just wondering if you had anything more to say about that idea of a continuing present in the present, that the, 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 if you want the sort of the, the violence real and psychic that lasts into the present uh, creates, really. Yeah, no, I, I think it's a it's a it's an important question, and I think it is the question of the violence of colonialism, just in general, right? I mean, it's the um, you know the degree to which you know the ripping away of people from land, resources from land, you know, continue, and 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 I think it's really important to both reckon with those histories, which means that you recognize them, which means that you then maybe tread a bit more lightly in the ways in which you care for what's now. Um, and, and I think that's really important. And to me, I think that what the United States has never done, it's never reckoned with the violence of taking the land from the millions of indigenous people. And it's never reckoned with um, the transportation, you know, the ripping away of Africans, turning them into blacks, to Negroes, turning them into property, right? Um, in order to produce the wealth of the nation. Like that's just never been dealt with. Um, and this attempt to distance is, it's impossible. You know, like you can't, you know, like, the, you know, it, it's just, it, 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 it's, it's what made the fabric of the country. I mean, I've done genealogical work in my family. Yeah, and they go back to 18th century North Carolina, both the English side and the African side. And they've been there in that same yeah. county you know, since 8, 1730. And it's just, yeah, and it's the same names, right? It's the Wilson name, the Brown, I mean, all of these familial names. And so it's just the truth and yeah. you have to deal with it, right? Because then you start to understand, ah, 
this is why we now have to do things differently. Maybe this needs to be more equitable. Maybe we don't need this. You know, I, I think it's, but the more we live with the mythology, the more delusional we become because that's an illusion of what happened as opposed to the truth of what happened. And 1619 is the truth of what happened in the United States. Yes, 1776 absolutely did happen. Nobody's saying it didn't. But 1619 was also incredibly important as well. And somehow the delusions, the mythologies that we're an exceptional nation, we're not. That we're the city shining on the hill, we're not. That this was a wilderness, it wasn't. That black people love being enslaved, we didn't. You know, and it's just time to put that to rest and just, you know, just figure out yeah. who we are. I think that that's the you sort of encapsulated there also that one of the that's one of the main the the main problem in Australia is that reckoning with the reality and the truth rather than with constructed sort of mythologies that kind of become almost a psychosis and it's really um yeah it, it's really fascinating thank you yeah but those symbols become leverage right and then they become in the architecture right and the monuments in the geography right and then you know they're passed on and they can't be moved so yeah. that's that's the work that the built environment does in that regard yeah thank you Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, thanks, Mabel, Anna, Nat, uh, and also Justin. I think we need to wrap up. Um, it's almost seven minutes past ten. Um, thanks, everyone, for joining us today. And um, I just would like to say that we have recorded the talk, so um, in case you want to um, re-watch it, feel free to jump into architalk.org website. Um, you'll find this talk along the rest of the previous talks. Um, thank you. This, uh, this is the last talk basically for the first semester and then we will restart in August. Thank you so much again, Mabel, for your time and have a great night. All right. Thanks, Mabel. Thanks, Mabel. Thank, thank you. Mabel. Thank, you. Thank, thank you. Thanks, Anna. Thanks, Anna. Thanks, See Anna. you.